All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the session uh, on urban church planting. Let's begin this time with a word of prayer. Uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. Once again, Lord, you've given us to come together and study your word. Pray, God, that even as we learn about church planting and the things that are involved in starting a church, Lord, I, I pray, God, that you will give us wisdom, direction, guidance, that, Lord, everything that we study, Lord, uh, uh, it'll be like seeds in our heart which will bear fruit in our lives. We thank you. We thank you for this opportunity, Lord. We open our hearts. We just received from you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so last class, we looked at quite a few uh, aspects, right? We looked at growth and consolidation, right? When, even as we grow, we looked at the pioneering stage, uh, uh, the different stages involved, pioneering stage, administrative stage, that is organizational and structural stage. Then you got the pastoral stage and the equipping, the building stage apostolic function stage and then becoming a self-sustaining church right so we also looked at multiplication and branching so as time goes on as a ministry you can always multiply you can start new churches you can start new branches in different cities and different towns right and um, envision your congregation meaning you share the vision with them uh send them out get them to be involved in your church planting right so initially when you're starting for the first time you will need to be involved um, at least 100 uh, percent but as you begin to you know plan a church plan get your people your congregation involved get church planting teams involved right uh, but you're always there to be a support and a strength right uh so Today, we'll get into spiritual aspects, right? So we've been talking about some of the practical things, right? Involved in in the church, when, when a church started, what happens, how the church grows, church growth, multiplication. Now, let's look at spiritual aspects. We looked at it initially. We looked at some of the natural aspects and spiritual aspects. But now let's go deeper into the spiritual aspects, because this is what uh, lays the foundation to a strong church, right? So chapter 17, the real battle for souls is a spiritual battle, right? Now, we know that God is at work in our cities, but we also know that Satan is working, right? Uh, we also know that Satan has his place in the spiritual realms, right? Uh, so you have the different realms in the spirit so say, satan is there he's working satan and his demons are working there's a lot of demonic activities in the heavenly places right we see that there are spiritual beings influencing influencing leaders influencing cities right remember when they when daniel prayed right he did not receive answers to the prayers because he said you know the the angel says there were the 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 there was demonic activity this in the spiritual in the heavenlies that was stopping the prayers from reaching heaven right uh, and and what are these spiritual influences right now we have many kinds of spiritual demonic influences that uh, that the enemy can use right but let's look at some of the ways that satan hinders people from receiving the gospel uh, right uh, now that's the whole point of church church is about people right it's not about administration being a pastor and all of that ministry the church ministry is about people only if you have people come into church it becomes a church uh, i mean it becomes like a ministry right if you only if for some reason we are the only pastors we have a couple of associate pastors and there is two people in the church it's it's not going to be of any help right we need people people are the church right so how does satan hinder people 
from receiving the gospel and getting people to uh, you know be saved uh, so let's look at a few points here right first one is he blinds the minds of people uh, there are a couple of verses there let's read uh, a few of them right second corinthians chapter 4 verse 3 and 4 maybe one of us can open to even matthew chapter 4 and verse 16 somebody else can open to acts 26 14 through 18 right so if we can just read these verses so we get a context and how the devil can hinder the work of the ministry now all of us right in ministry we, we we want the church to grow we want our ministries to grow but the devil has strategies he has ways of stopping this growth right so one is by blinding the minds of people second corinthians 4 3 to 4 yes go ahead but even if our gospel is veiled it is veiled to those who are perishing whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Mm. Let's read Matthew 4.16. Matthew 4.16. The people, the people which sat in darkness saw, the, saw great light, and to them, we sat in the regions and shadows of death, life is sprung up. Yes. Let's also read uh, Acts 26, 14 through 18. Acts 26, 14 through 18. Acts 26, 14 through 18. And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. So I said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Amen. Right now, we see here in all of these passages, right? We have the aspect of darkness and light, right? The devil's number one way of hindering people from receiving the gospel is by blinding people's minds, right? So, what does he say? He has various forms of deception. He says, you know, hey, this is not true. Jesus died on the cross. That may be true, but how can you receive forgiveness how can you receive healing how can you stand holy right? he blinds the minds of people that's one way or another way is he brings deception he says there is no jesus right? there is no person named jesus there is no uh what there's, there's he was not in the messiah he's not the messiah there, there, there is no messiah there's all of this is man-made things these are all ideologies, all thoughts of people. He blinds the minds of people. Right? Remember, uh, I know you're learning uh, Corinthians. Uh, what did he do? What What were the people in Corinth saying? They were They were blinded. When you go even to Athens and uh, and Greece and in um, uh, Achaia and uh, and then he goes later on in a second missionary journey, we see that they were all blinded. They, they had great understanding. The Athens had great understanding, right? Even in Aeropagus, they had great understanding, but their minds were blinded. These deceptions, these lies that the enemy put into people's minds becomes a hindrance for the gospel, right? Now, these deceptions can, it's not always, you know, on individuals. It can be over groups of people, over societies 
over religious leaders, over institutions, you can have it. Blindness, right? Number one way where the devil works, right? And we'll talk about how, what is the responsibility of the church, right? But we're just trying to understand what the enemy can use is as we, you know, as we, God has called us to plant a church, do the ministry. God is working, but on the other side, the enemy is doing this as well, blinding people's eyes. So he can, um, you know, use a group of society, group of people, religious leaders. He can use institutions to stop the work of the gospel. And, uh, and, and he can also use our own failures, our own weaknesses to break the work of the ministry. We talk about that in the coming chapters as well, right? So number one, blinding the minds of people. Don't believe this. It's not true. It, it, it you know, you have prayed as your healing. It's not happened yet. Right? So he has many ways. Two is holding the people in bondage. Right now, remember when you start a ministry, you start a church. You got people coming into the church. People may come in from different faiths, and not always they will accept right there will be people who will say okay i don't believe in this or i don't believe in anything that you're doing uh, and i just believe it's a waste of time uh, i don't know if it's happened to you but we had a couple of youth who came up to me straight and said this is all nonsense what you're speaking i was taken aback because they sat for the whole service right but they said it's all nonsense do you even believe all of this and he holds people in bondage, spiritual prisons, right? If you look at a natural prison, you see a natural prison, but there are spiritual prisons where he holds them in that, right? Ephesians 2, 2, let's read that. And also 1 John 5, 19. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, let's also read 1 John 5, 19. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Yes. So the devil has ways of holding people in bondage, right? And the reason he does this is because he does not want people to come to Christ. He does not want people to know about the truth of the gospel. Now, these spiritual bondages, these demonic domination or this demonic force that we see is usually through immoral deeds, sinful natures, addictions, social evils, prostitution, corruption, drug addictions, uh, trafficking. These are the spirits that the devil uses to keep people in bondage. Right. So for example, just look at uh, look at somebody maybe who's been living a sexually immoral life. Right. Now why is it that they're continuing to live in that sexual immorality? Because the desires of the flesh, and there are demons who uh, agitate or encourage those sexual desires. So what happens? They are continuing to be in prison. And the more they are in that, the more deeper and deeper and deeper they go. Look at drug addictions, right? people who are addicted to drugs, right? they, they say, hey, uh, even if they want to get out, they're not able to. Why? Because there are demonic forces that are putting them in bondage. Right? I know of many young people, a genuine heart, they want to overcome drug addiction. They've come and I speak to them over uh, just talking to them, ministering to them. Young people, young guys right early you know, maybe 28 29 
the, that age, almost in early 30s as well, they want to give up. They don't want to live with this addiction in their life. But they are unable to. Why? Because the demons are still working so strongly over their life. Right? There are a few of them who have shared with me that they're so addicted to pornography that they are unable to look at their own mother. They're unable to look at their own sister in the right way. Now, what can you say for that? Right? These are young boys, uh, early 20s, addicted to pornography. When they, they, they can't talk to girls, they can't talk to women. If they talk, there's something happening here. Why? It's a, it's a demonic work. The devil is holding them in bondage. These are spirits that are working. Now remember, when people uh, come into church and you know, come into, uh, and they ask for prayer, and they share with us, right? Uh, because as pastors, they will come and share, right? Remember, you're not dealing with the natural. You can't just tell them, hey, just go lock yourself, you know, go and just pray to God. God will help you. That's not going to work. Why? Because they are in, the devil is holding them in bondage. They are still in the devil's trap. Right? They can't just come out of it just like that. They got to believe in Jesus, trust in his work. And then there's a work that has to happen after that. Right. So these spirits are working, hindering people keeping them in bondage. No, you you cannot stay without pornography. You cannot stay without the drugs. You cannot stay without, uh, you know, trafficking or all these addictions that are there. You cannot stay without it. Right Now, the enemy is using subtle ways. And um, during the ment last mentoring hour, we looked at media and technology. And subtle ways, you know, there's this... Uh, uh, mother who came up to me and said, please pray for my daughter. She's 13 years old and she watches, she's on social media for over six hours in a day and I'm not able to handle her. If I take the phone away, if I take the tab, or the, the gadgets away, she's willing to bring down the whole house. She's willing to burn down the house. She gets violent. She starts breaking things in the house. She starts uh, hurting herself. And so I'm very scared. You see how the enemy is working? He's not, he's not worried about wait till 18 and then I'll bring these problems now. He's starting small. Right? And these are all the ways, the tactics of that the devil is using to hold people in that bondage. Three, he hinders the proclamation of the gospel. So as a church, so for example, you, you've planted your church, right? And as a church, we talked about how God wants to multiply us. He wants us to reach out. He wants us to touch and permeate and penetrate all seven spheres of influence in the society. What will he do? He will hinder the proclamation of the gospel. The devil will have ways to, you know, he may close doors. He may bring in situations in your personal life. He may bring in situations uh, among people within the church. He may bring in challenges within the church. Uh, you know, he may disrupt our mind, our thinking, right? He may just cause confusions within the church, people within the congregation. Right? There's so much that he can do. And he hinders the proclamation of the gospel. When we come to a place saying, okay, uh, let's not do this now. Right? Of course, we ask God to open the right doors. You step in at the right time. But he, the devil tries to hinder the gospel because he knows the power of the gospel. He knows that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for those who believe. He knows that those bondages can break if you believe. He knows it. So he knows the power of the gospel, so he hinders it. Let's look at a few verses here. Romans chapter 15 and verse 30 and 31. Romans 15, 30 and 31. Maybe someone else, anyone else can open to First Thessalonians 2, 18. 
and second old Thessalonians 3 1 to 3. Let's start with Romans 15 30 and 31. Yes, would anyone like to read? Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. Hmm. Right. Hmm. So the context here is, before we read the next passage, the context here is not everyone accepted apostle paul in especially in jerusalem because god had called him for uh the gentiles now here in this passage romans 15 uh, paul is planning his last visit like he's going to uh his visit to rome right he's going to rome uh and he's saying pray for me that when i go to rome and i proclaim the gospel that there will be no hindrance Right, that there would be no one who will stop me from preaching the gospel. Right? First Thessalonians 2 18. First Thessalonians 2 18. Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. Right. So very clearly, Paul is saying, we wanted to come to you, but there was a hindrance from Satan. And so Satan hinders the work of the ministry. He hinders the gospel. Right now, these methods of hindering the gospel can be, again, as I mentioned, different ways. Right. Uh, so as pastors, as ministers, we got to always be on our guard. Uh, know that, you know, this is what God has called me to do. This is what I must do. This go back to God, pray, seek his face, um, continue to go strong. These are things that we must do. Right? Fourth one, very important. He hinders, the devil hinders the work of this uh, work of the gospel by weakening the local church. He can cause confusions he can cause problems he can cause divisions within the church now if we read the entire epistle of corinthians first and second corinthians plenty of problems one division two uh, there was groupism three there was no uh, there was you know people were having the lord's table as if it was food and uh, there was divisions caused there. Then there were people saying, hey, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow Cephas. Right. So he can bring in weakness in a local church by infiltrating his own thoughts and plans. So that is why Paul writes this beautiful episode of Corinthians and he says, this is how a church should be. And he emphasizes about love, he emphasizes about the gifts of the Spirit, and the unity in the gifts and all of that. So let's look at a few examples from Revelations. Revelations 2, in the church of Smyrna, a group of that belongs to Satan, devil is going to cause some of them to be put into prison. Now, persecution is not, it's not a nice feeling, right? Now, many of us may be in urban settings, Right. Being in urban settings, we may not have faced persecution. But if you're in the eye of persecution, it's not a, a good place to be. It is, you know, uh, I was doing a study on uh, the the persecutions on Kandamals a couple of years back. And uh, what we have heard of, right, or what the news shows is only maybe 10% of what happened uh, at uh at Kandamal in Orissa, uh, 2008-2010. A presence of a group of people that belongs to Satan. Devil is going to bring persecution. Persecution can really break the strength of a church. It's not easy. It's really not easy because, um, yes, we do see that persecution. When there's persecution, we see that churches have become stronger greater more powerful greater anointing uh but there's also the fact that you know 
it caused causes a lot of damage lives being lost right uh, people have lost their loved ones in persecution what happens it's a painful thing right uh, it, it that many a times people you know believers who've lost their loved ones through persecution they're unable to you know digest the fact that you know my maybe my brother my sister my parents have died because they believed in jesus yeah. it's not easy to accept it right uh, so sometimes the devil can use this persecution to bring a weakness into the church two the church in pergamos a place where satan's throne is and satan dwells the doctrine of balaam infil infiltrating the church again here a second way where the enemy comes in the devil comes in to bring weakness in a congregation is by wrong doctrines by false doctrines was it happening in the early church plenty paul writes to timothy in uh, in first timothy he says stick to sound doctrine second timothy he says preach the word in season and out of season right uh, and, and there's an emphasis on doctrine. Paul is very certain, he's very direct. He says, make sure as ministers of God, First Timothy chapter 3, he says, make sure that what you are entrusted with, the gospel is preached in sound doctrine. That's what also happened to the Thessalonians. Remember in Thessalonica, we, we see that people came into the church and started the Jews and the others came in and said, hey, Jesus has already come and gone and you all are still here. And then Paul had to sit down and write and say, hey, uh, if you don't you know that during the rapture, these are the things that are going to happen. Right. Uh, and, and so it's very easy for the devil to come up with false doctrines. What about what we see now? right now around us globally as a church are there doctrines that are not in line with scripture plenty of them now these are churches which have maybe 10,000 20,000 people in their congregation 20,000 people 10 15 20,000 people huge churches right but the doctrine wrong teachings wrong doctrines coming into the church Right. So you and I must be very careful. Social media, you know, we can watch so much, test the word of God. Right? And we look at the church's responsibility as well. So the devil can use wrong doctrines. He can come and say, hey, the Holy Spirit doesn't work anymore. When Jesus went, he went with the Holy Spirit. Or there's no such thing as healing that went that stopped in the book of Acts. He can bring in in a very subtle way. Right, the the cross is only for the Jews. You you're not part of it, or if you've sinned, you're no longer holy. You you don't have a right standing before God. You're not righteous. You're not justified. These are ways he brings in false doctrines. What happens when there are false doctrines in a church? The church becomes weak. Right? Because some people are believing in one thing, then there's another group of people believing in another thing. Third one, the church in Thyatira. False prophetess Jezebel at work in the church. Now, this false prophet, the word, the false prophetess Jezebel is basically uh, the characteristics of Jezebel we see who, uh, in, the, uh, in the Old Testament and Kings. Uh, Ahab's wife Jezebel, same attributes, pride, arrogance, or a knowing all attitude. These are ways uh, you know that the devil can infiltrate. Pride is the number one way that the devil can infiltrate a church, make a church weak. Right? Fourth one, the church in Philadelphia, a presence of a group that belongs to Satan will cause them to bow before the church. Now, this is dangerous. This is a dangerous place. Imagine, there's a presence of a group of people that belong to Satan who are in the church. And they will cause them to bow down before them. So Paul is, so, so the letter here in the, the 
that John is writing here, he's saying, these are ways that the devil can infiltrate a church. Now, it may not be in big ways, but it can start small. It can start really small. So as pastors, you've got to be aware, especially when the church is growing, when the church is small, you've got 50, 100 people in your church. Be aware of what is happening in the church. Of course, you cannot control your congregation because they'll be listening to a lot of things online, uh, a lot of preachers. They may go to other meetings and seminars. We are in no place to stop them from going. But you and I can preach the word, let the light of the gospel, let the truth of God's word minister to them. Remember that truth is truth is stronger light is greater than darkness right so what is the church's responsibility the church is to be the light to the gentiles opening prisons doors and bringing those who are in darkness into his light right now the church has to be a light to the gentiles Jesus talks about this in many places, right? Especially in the book of Matthew, he talks about it, right? He, he's, a, he's preaching uh, on the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. He says, you are the light of the world. Um, uh, Matthew 5, 14, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to the whole house, right? So. God is calling us as a church to be a light to the Gentiles. So wherever we go, as a church, when I say church, it could be singular as a person, as an individual, or as a body of Christ. You know, when you plant a church in a city or in a locality, you're bringing light to that place. And you are a light. There may be hundreds and thousands of Gentiles around. You, the church, are going to be the light to that place. But you will impact that area. You will impact that city. And that's the mindset that we must have. We may be 10 people in a church, planted a new church, 10 people. right? And there are hundreds and maybe thousands of people around you. You are the light. Which is greater, light or darkness? Light. So remember that. Stand by that. Right. The odds may be one, maybe one percent to ninety percent, but still you're greater. In the natural, you're just ten people, and then there's thousand people who are, you know, not not for the gospel, but you are the light, a light to the Gentiles. That's what Jesus says. So you are able to impact those thousand people more than them trying to impact you. The church has been given kingdom authority and spiritual weapons to overthrow the work of the devil. Kingdom authority. Can you picture this? Jesus is saying, I have given you the authority to trample over snakes and scorpions. The church has given you authority, each one of us. As pastors, as leaders, we got to stand by that. Hey, I have the authority over the devil. It's not, uh, it's not that we have to wait till we have 1,000 people in the church and then I have authority over the devil in that area. No. The church has been already given kingdom authority. Right. And we use that authority as pastors, as leaders. You show the authority. Let your congregation see that you are standing in authority. Let them see the work of God in your life. Let them see it. They, they grasp it. Right? As, as a congregation, they grasp that, hey, pastor said this. Pastor saying we have the authority. Right. He's given God has given us the other. So we can pray for people. We can pray for sickness. We can pray for God to open doors, for God to open blind eyes. We can do that. We don't have to wait till we're 100 people. We can do it now. Right. What happens? Uh, 
the, the mindset changes. But everything changes. You and I have been given authority. I remember this one time we went to, uh, I was visiting uh, another city. And when we went to, I don't know if I've used this example before, but if I have, forgive me, uh, but I'm just reminded of this. We went to this other city and I was, it's very young. I didn't know much of God's word and all of those, you know, all the wonderful promises of God. Uh, uh, but as ministering there, probably just 22, 23 years old. And, uh, and as we were ministering, we finished, we were doing, you know, uh, like something like a supernatural time. I, I didn't know the word supernatural. So it was just uh, a time of worship and seeking the Lord, praying in tongues and all of that. So we were praying, and all of a sudden, this young boy, probably about 15 or 17 years, 15 to 16 years old, he began to manifest. And he was talking in a loud, gruff voice, and it was, uh, really shook me, because I never thought that, you know, I've never seen something like it before. And I got really afraid. I know it's okay to get afraid, but I got really afraid. I said, God, the first thing that came to my mind is, God, you have given me authority. I don't feel like I have the authority right now because this this force that is coming against me is so strong. And I remember saying, God, your word says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And all of a sudden, I just I just felt like you know somebody is coming and putting on you know uh, uh, like an armor. I felt like I was in the army. I had these uh, spiritual machine guns, so to speak. I suddenly felt powerful from being just very powerless. Suddenly, I felt this power, and I felt like God just saying, "Hey, I've given you the authority." You just use my name. I'm there. I'm there for you. Right. And uh, long story short, we just you know, we, we just prayed over him. Said in Jesus' name, right. I command you to come out. And uh, I think it was just 10, 15 minutes. He was completely delivered. And uh, you know, young boy, completely delivered. You know, God had just delivered him. And I thought to myself, God has given us the church, the authority, he has given us the spiritual weapons to overthrow the work of the devil. Here's what's interesting, Ephesians chapter 6. Paul is writing to the letter, writing the letter in Ephesus, and he says, Ephesians 6, put on the armor of God. And he's, he's trying to bring the whole uh, aspect of the Roman soldier is looking at that and trying to translate that into um, the armor of God here. And he says, put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, uh, the shield of faith, uh, the feet with the readiness of the gospel. Right? And, and he's saying, put on the armor of God. But he's also saying, he doesn't say, take it off after some time. He says, put it on, leave it on. So God is given us the authority to overthrow the works of the devil. So as pastors and leaders, how can we stand with this authority? How can we be firm in this understanding? The more we go into God's presence, the more we spend time with God, learn His word, ask for a greater measure of His anointing, people will recognize it in, in, in our lives. Your congregation will recognize, hey, the pastor, they begin to catch that vision. Hey, God has given us authority. Pastors, you know, the pastor is saying he's preaching, but he's also showing it in his actions. People will grasp that. Remember, people may not hear, understand all your sermons as a pastor, right? They may not understand anything sometimes, but they see your life. They see what you're able to do, right? Um, I remember, uh, you know, right now, what we do is, uh, you know, 
uh, we have some outreach teams that we have made, right? And these outreach teams are teams of twos. And I said, okay, let's all go out and we will reach out to people. Right now, I know it may sound old school, right? But the gospel is still powerful. The gospel still works. It will still work. And so I, you know, I, we had like a small training, said, okay, this is how you do it. This is how we just minister to people. And also when people are, you know, probably not happy and angry, it just walk out in peace. So we went out as teams. We went out, oh, they were noticing. And so after that whole outreach, they, you know, some of them from church said, uh, how come you spoke like that? How come you were not, you know, you didn't flinch when they said anything? I said, because God has given me the authority. God has given us the weapons to overcome the work of the devil. And they caught the vision. They caught that. Right. So now they all go out on outreach teams, reaching out. Of course, I keep telling them, you know, be careful with all the things that are happening. We must be we must be wise as well, right? But they caught that vision. They caught that, hey, God is able to bring people. God is able to minister to people. Right. So as pastors, we lead the way. We set the example. Right. Matthew 12, 28 and 29. Let's read that. Matthew. 12, 28, and 29. Matthew chapter 12, 28, and 29. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house. Mm. So here, uh, the Lord Jesus is talking about binding, right? And, and I'm sure that all of us use this, right? When in our prayers, we bind the work of the devil, meaning we, we control, we overdue, we subdue the work of the devil, right? And so as a church's responsibility, we can bind the, the works of the devil you're 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 putting a hold to the work of the devil so for example there are too many uh you know suicidal cases suicide cases in in and around your neighborhood you, you bind the spirit of suicide now you may we may think oh what how can i bind i'm so small and we are only five people in church See, it's not about the numbers. It's about, you know, never think about the natural. Look at it in the spiritual. In the spiritual, when you pray, right, what's happening? The, the works of the devil is being bound. Right? In the spiritual, just maybe three or four or five people, but in the spiritual, it's a war. It is, it is not something very simple. People may say, hey, what, five people are praying. That's OK. In the spiritual, it's a mighty thing to do. Look at the cross. When people saw Jesus dying on the cross, what was it? Complete failure. Thousands were following him. In the end, there was 120 people who still believed in him. Where are the thousands gone? Oh, he died on the cross. It's shameful. In the natural, they saw it. But what does Paul say? To the Colossians, he said, having disarmed every principalities, every power of darkness on the cross. He made a public spectacle of the devil. Where did he make it? In the spirituals. In the natural? A poor man who's dying on the cross. But in the spiritual, he disarmed principalities. He disarmed the powers of darkness. Right. So we are to bind the works of the devil. We are to say, God, I, I pray, Holy Spirit, you will bind, right? If the enemy is trying to infiltrate your church, if he's trying to infiltrate people's lives, bind the work of the devil. Right? You use the authority as a leader, right? And Luke 11, 21 and 22 talks about overcoming. Let's read that last verse and let me close. Luke 11, 21 and 22.
when a strong man fully armed guards his own palace his goods are in peace but when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils hmm. so here again god is saying god is calling us to overcome the works of the devil right to destroy the strongholds destroy those spiritual prisons and the and the best part is for us as believers is that the price has already been paid the cross has already gained victory all we are doing is to walk in that authority right uh, so that we can minister to people bless people bring people to christ and even as we do this now we need patience we need to be patient we need to be wise all of this is very important aspects right so uh, we don't overdo things saying you know you don't just go into a certain place and say uh, you know come and come to church or this is what jesus did no that you know things have changed we need to be wise right we see the lord jesus also is very wise right he knew his life was a threat in jerusalem he moved away he went to judea he didn't say no i will stay in jerusalem itself because i am the son of god no wise he went he came back when things are okay right so we also need to you know even as pastors as leaders we need to develop the ability to be wise in the way we handle our ministries right uh, so i want to encourage all of us right uh, if god is calling you to start launch a ministry or you're already in full time ministry remember these things right there is a devil that's working but god has given us the authority over the devil you and i are already victorious right so we'll stop here and next class we'll look at praying and exercising authority uh, and what prayer does to a ministry uh, which is basically the backbone to every fruitful ministry right right thank you so much for joining this class uh, i'll see you next class have a great day ahead God bless. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you.